In the upper room discourse, um, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he shared with his disciples some incredible truth. Um, In the first part of chapter 15, Jesus spoke with his disciples, and he spoke with them about the relationship that they were to have with one another, or with himself. Then he branches from that into the relationship that they would have with one another. But then there is a, um, a shift that takes place in verse 18, and that is the relationship that God's children will have to the world. And um, in that passage, in John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, uh, Jesus says here, and many of you are familiar with this, I just want to bring it up again, verse, verses 18 and 19 of chapter 15, if the world hates you, You know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. As a child of God, if we are in fellowship with Jesus Christ, if we're standing firm uh, on his word and we're desiring to grow in our relationship with him, then we can expect persecution from the world. We can expect that. Um, and you won't have to look very far if you, if you look at the Apostle Paul's ministry. Uh, just read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You'll see the persecution that he went through there in his ministry. We'll see some persecution that Jeremiah will go through even towards the end of uh, right before the fall of Jerusalem here in chapter 38. Chapter 38 is where we're going to be today. We're continuing this study in the book of Jeremiah. It's been a great study Uh, tracking through the seventh section, the messages and events before the fall of Jerusalem. And the fall of Jerusalem will take place in our next lesson in chapter 39. Uh, And so we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. But uh, when we track through this chapter today in chapter 38, um, there is a great truth here for us. And I believe that that great truth is this, that God notices when his children are persecuted by the world for standing on his word. God notices when his children are persecuted by the world, by the world for standing on his word. In chapters 37 through 38, these two chapters, they reveal the final months before the absolute fall of Jerusalem, and they also reveal what happens to God's prophet in the midst of those moments. And as I've studied this particular section, uh, Jeremiah just has, he just has tremendous courage, I think, as he faces the world and as he, as he, he determines to plant himself on the word of God and to proclaim the word of God. Uh, it is courageous and uh, it's encouraging to study that. Um, But let's remember that Jeremiah is faithful to the Lord. Jeremiah is faithful to the word. He's faithful to his calling. We're going to see that in this chapter. He's going to remain faithful to that. Yet when one is faithful, faithful in the areas of life that they should be faithful in does not mean that they are immune to a hostile world system. And it is a world system that hates God and it hates truth. In our last lesson, we learned that there was a certain captain of the guard in chapter 37 whose name was Irijah, and it may have been that he was related to the false prophet Hananiah. He may have been the grandson of uh, the prophet Hananiah who we saw in chapter 28. Um, But his claim, Irijah's claim to Jeremiah was, you are going over to the Chaldeans in verse 13 of chapter 37. In other words, the claim was, Jeremiah, you are unpatriotic, all right? Your messages that you are bringing to God's people are really messages that are meant to, uh, to be um, harmful. Actually, we're going to see that today in that, in that accusation. The accusation that Elijah had was that, they, that, was that he was unpatriotic, um, that he was being a traitor to the nation. So as a result, they beat him. We saw that in our last lesson, and they throw him into into a dungeon. Now, as we come to Jeremiah 38 today, we're going to find these accusations don't let up, and we're going to see those accusations today in verse 4, that Jeremiah was accused of not seeking the well-being of his countrymen, which was, when you study Jeremiah's life, it's utterly foolish to take that position, but these guys do. And so we're going to continue in this study 
on these moments leading up to the fall of Jerusalem. And we're going to learn that this world will come against Jeremiah in three ways. This world will come against Jeremiah in three ways. Now we're going to see the first way in which the world comes against Jeremiah. It's seen in the first five verses there. The world rejected the truth of Jeremiah's message. The world rejected the truth of Jeremiah's message. Now in our last lesson, Jeremiah was in a dungeon and he was being transported to the court of the guardhouse. And we know that while he was in the court of the guardhouse, he was restricted in a sense from going anywhere that he wanted to go. But he did have some freedom to speak to the Jews uh, in some capacity. And his message was the same. I mean, when you look at uh, Jeremiah um, and his ministry here before the fall of Jerusalem, you've got to give him some credit because his message remains the same to the Jews. And it is this, that if they stay in Jerusalem, then they are going to die by the hand of the Babylonians, by famine and by pestilence. We're going to see that here in these first five verses. That's his message to God's people. That message hasn't changed. However, when you have people who are faithful to preach the full counsel of God's word, you can almost bet that there will be in the background those who will try to hinder that work from moving forward. And those individuals are mentioned right here in chapter 38, verse 1. God takes note of them. They're listed here. Let's, let's begin to read verses 1 through 3 together. Jeremiah chapter 38, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now Shepatiah, the son of Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of Pashur, and Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pashur, the son of Malchijah, heard the words that Jeremiah was speaking to all the people, saying, and this is what Jeremiah is preaching here, Thus says the Lord, He who stays in this city, in Jerusalem, will die by the sword, and by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, uh, will live and have his own life as booty and stay alive. Thus says the Lord, this city will certainly be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. Now these guys that are mentioned here in verse 1, they're powerful. These are powerful guys. Uh, they were men who served under King Zedekiah. And we have to understand that the message that Jeremiah gave to the people was a message that would have negatively affected the king's war efforts as he attempted to resist Babylonian captivity. I mean, King Zedekiah needed the Jews to stay and to fight in Jerusalem. He didn't want them to leave, and neither did his officials uh, that are listed here. And so verse 4 goes on, and it says, Then the officials said to the king, so they go to King Zedekiah, Now let this man be put to death. And they're speaking of Jeremiah here. Inasmuch as he is discouraging the men of war who are left in this city and all the people by speaking such words to them, for this man is not seeking the well-being of this people, but rather for their harm. And Warren Wearsby correctly observed this about the officials. They accused Jeremiah of not seeking the welfare of the people, and yet the welfare of the people was the thing to which he had dedicated his life. And I'm just going to say, it is not popular to stand on the word of God. It's not popular. It's not popular to stand on God's truth. We're living in a time right now in our nation's uh, history where it is easier and more acceptable to give people labels rather than to engage in civil discussion. Um, if you take the position that homosexuality is a sin, uh, then you're going to be labeled, you're going to get, you're going to have a label. That label will be that you're a bigot. If you believe that the word of God very clearly teaches that the role of elder or pastor in a local church context is reserved for men only, then you're going to be labeled a misogynist. You're going to be labeled a misogynist. And if you're going to stand for the exclusive message of the gospel, and we'll say that other, all other world religions are dead wrong, then you're going to be labeled a xenophobe. But that's what this world does, and we can expect that. That's what this world does. This world is notorious for twisting the words and the intentions of faithful saints who want what is best for God's people and for those who are lost. And the worst part is, and the reality is, there are churches that are involved in this act of twisting up the truth of God's word. And that's what these officials do right here in verse, verse 1. They twist up Jeremiah's intentions. 
Jeremiah is a true prophet of God. He wasn't afraid to call sin, sin. He wasn't afraid to call uh, God's people to turn from their sin, that they might live in the joy and the freedom that God provides. And so did Jeremiah do and say these things because he hated the people of God? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. These officials, they're playing a dangerous game here. Verse 4 says that they actually called for the death of Jeremiah, and they bring this death sentence to King Zedekiah. Now, King Zedekiah, we saw a little bit, of, we saw a little bit more about King Zedekiah. We're going to see him a lot more today, but he is a Class A politician. King Zedekiah likes his popularity. He wants the approval of people, and like Pontius Pilate, he was happy to rinse his hands clean of the responsibilities that God had given to him as king. So he says in verse 5, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do what? Nothing. <laughs> That's a lie. <laughs> He's the king. If anybody could do something, it would have been King Zedekiah. How would you like to be Jeremiah in that moment? The reality was these officials may have rejected the truth of God's word. They may have rejected the truth of God's message. And King Zedekiah may have disowned him, but King Zedekiah knew what Jeremiah was. And even though it seemed as though Jeremiah had hit a real low point in his ministry, God notices. God notices this. And it brings us to the second way in which the world came against Jeremiah, and that's seen by the fact that the world mistreated God's messenger. And you'll see that in verses 6 through 13. The world mistreated God's messenger. And these officials wanted to stop God's message from reaching the ears of God's people, so they toss Jeremiah into a cistern. Look with me, verse 6. It says, Then they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchijah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guardhouse, and they let Jeremiah down with ropes. Now notice what it says here about the cistern. Now in the cistern there was no water, but only mud, and Jeremiah sank into the mud. Now cisterns, they're pretty, cisterns are pretty large. They're used for storing uh, water in Palestine, but what is fascinating here in verse 6 is that it says that there is no water in the cistern. And this shows us that they were in the, mass, in the middle of a massive drought. God had predicted that there would be a massive uh, drought that would take place before the fall of Jerusalem. I have a picture here of a cistern which shows that a typical cistern was in the shape of a pear and could go as deep as 40 feet. And by the fact that this particular cistern was owned by one of the king's sons tells us that this was probably pretty deep inside. And so that's why you read there, Jeremiah is let down by ropes. He would have been seriously injured if they would have tossed him into that thing, so they let him down there in ropes. And so Jeremiah is down, but he's not out. And this was, an un this was really, I, I believe, the ultimate test for Jeremiah. Before he saw the word of God fulfilled, before he witnessed the downfall of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians, Jeremiah is, was a castaway for 40 years. He had been faithfully serving God. However, the people, the Jewish people, were not behind him. Friends were lacking. Family was absent. The king, King Zedekiah, had no moral or ethical backbone to help him out. And unlike the officials who served under King Jehoiakim, who we looked at in chapter 36, those officials were trying to help Jeremiah. They were trying to hide him from the king. These officials here want uh, Jeremiah to be ha harmed. And so if Jeremiah is going to get out of this pit, if he's going to get out of this pit, it's going to be by the hand of God alone. It's going to be by the hand of God alone. And perhaps you're here today or you're listening online and you've gone through a series of unfortunate events where you've been left wondering, where is God in the middle of this? You've been faithful to him. You've been faithful to his word. I'm sure Jeremiah is asking the same thing as he's thrown in that, in that cistern. He's been faithful to the word of God. 
Yet the circumstances that you're in right now perhaps are less than desirable. This is the moment where you need to remain faithful to, to the Lord. This is the test. It is your moment of truth. And what comes out of you in this moment will either reveal a heart that is trusting the Lord or not. If you want to throw in the towel, don't. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 50, 50, 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord, even if your toil for the Lord's sake has led you to a pit. It may be that you are not able to physically do anything in this moment that may change the circumstance or the outcome here. Jeremiah was powerless. It may be that you are unable to say anything that will repair a relationship that has been damaged by what seems to be beyond repair. It may be a family situation, a ministry situation, a work situation that has caused you much grief. Whatever it is, the test is before you and the question remains. And the question is, will you trust God in the middle of that difficulty? And if that is you today, then the challenge for you, my challenge for you would be this, to study chapter 17 in this book. Because in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7, it says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. This is a powerful, powerful chapter in this book, and it won't be the last time that I quote it, that I quote it here in this study. When we are not up to the task at hand and when the challenge before us is impossible, we have a God who is great at taking on those types of challenges. We do. Trust him. And watch, watch what he's capable of doing. In our pastoral theology class at Frontier School of the Bible, 10 years ago now, <laughs> we had a little booklet, and um, it was by Warren Wearsby, and it was titled, On Being a Servant of God. And in that, um, in that book, we studied a little statement that Warren Wearsby made in that book, and it, and it was this, ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. I didn't understand the weight of that statement uh, 10 years ago uh, when I studied that book, but after 10 years of full-time ministry, I can say that God gives his saints wonderful, wonderful opportunities to trust him. He does. And if you do, if you trust him, he is able and capable to work in amazing ways. There is not a single challenge that is too hard for the Lord. Reality was, Jeremiah is in this muddy, nasty pit. The world had persecuted him for standing on God's word, and he had every reason in the book to give up on his calling in this moment. But there is a verse 7, and it begins with, but, but. It kind of reminds me of the, the same buts in Ephesians, but God. But there is a God in heaven who is sovereign. But there is a God who is in control, who watches out for his children. Let's read verses 7 and 8. But Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch, while he was in the king's palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. Now the king was sitting in the gate of Benjamin, and abed Melech went out from the king's palace and spoke to the king. Now this Ethiopian eunuch is going to be used powerfully by the Lord, and we don't know much about him other than what we read here and in the next chapter. God's going to take notice of this man. One thing is, was for certain, though, he was a pretty bold man to do to do what he does here in this next verse. He goes before King Zedekiah, and he says in verse 9, My Lord, the king, these men have acted wickedly in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they cast into the cistern, and he will die right where he is because of the famine, for there is no more bread in the city. I mean, this guy comes out of nowhere, and he takes the time to confront the king of a nation on Jeremiah's treatment. I mean, uh, Ebed-Melech is apparently concerned for Jeremiah's safety, 
for his well-being. I believe that God raised this man up. It was God who put those concerns on Ebed Melech's heart. It was God who was watching out for the safety of his people, or of his prophet, rather. And King Zedekiah is not just consistent, he's not consistent at all. He told, in, he told the officials in verse 5 that he had no power to help Jeremiah out in that situation, which was a lie. That was a lie. Um, and now, at the request of this Ethiopian man, he gives orders to have Jeremiah rescued. Look with me, verses 10 through 12. It says, Then the king commanded ebed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take 30 men from here under your authority and bring up Jeremiah the prophet from the cistern before he dies. So ebed Melech took the men under his authority and went into the king's palace to a place beneath the storeroom and took from there worn-out clothes and worn-out rags and let them down by ropes into the cistern to Jeremiah. Then ebed Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Put these worn out clothes and rags under your armpits, um, under your armpits, under the ropes, and Jeremiah did so. I believe Ebed Melech has a tender heart uh, for God's prophet. He didn't only have a spiritual dimension to him, he was a down to earth kind of guy. He knew that if Jeremiah wasn't careful, then those ropes would have cut into his skin as they were trying to pull him out of that pit. So he had Jeremiah rest his arms on some clothing. Verse 13 says, So they pulled Jeremiah out, or they pulled Jeremiah up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern, and Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse. Now, listen to me. God notices when his children are persecuted by the world for standing on his word. Jeremiah had many needs, and God is meeting those needs. Ebed Melech is a loving channel that was used by God for the glory of God, and God will remember this good deed that transpires. And we're going to see him again in, in our next lesson in chapter 39. But that takes us to the third way in which the world comes against Jeremiah, and it's seen in verses 14 through 28. King Zedekiah can't stay away from Jeremiah because he knew what Jeremiah was. One minute... He is sending God's prophet off with his officials to be silenced. The next, he is having him rescued at the request of an Ethiopian eunuch. King Zedekiah is a weak leader. One of the signs that God is about to judge a nation, we see that right here. God is about to judge the nation of Judah. In chapter 39, that judgment comes. A part of um, God's judgment on a nation is that he will give that nation weak leaders who stand for nothing. One of the more extreme examples that I could think of involves a Supreme Court nominee who, who uh, failed to provide the definition for the word woman because she was not a, quote, biologist. Yet somehow she's to be trusted to adjudicate America's rights from the highest court in the land. This is weak leadership, and King Zedekiah is a weak leader. Now look with me at verse 14. It begins, and it says, Then King Zedekiah sent and had Jeremiah the prophet brought to him at the third entrance that is in the house of the Lord. And we don't know where this third entrance is. Uh, King Zedekiah wanted to meet with Jeremiah in the last chapter, and when he did, he wanted to meet with him in secret. That's what he's doing right here. I've looked at a bunch of my commentaries on this verse. None of them could plainly state where this entrance was. But one thing is for certain, this would be the last meeting that King Zedekiah would have with Jeremiah before the fall of Jerusalem. And King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah from verse 14, let's continue reading here, I'm going to ask you something. Do not hide anything from me. Verse 15, then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, if I tell you, will you not certainly put me to death? Besides, if I give you advice, you will not listen to me. But King Zedekiah swore to Jeremiah in secret, saying, As the Lord lives, who made this life for us, surely I will not put you to death, nor will I give you over to the hand of these men who are seeking your life. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts and the God of Israel, if you will indeed go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then you will live. This city will not be burned with fire and you and your household will survive. But if you will not go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then this city will be given over to the hand of the Chaldeans and they will burn it with fire 
and you yourself will not escape with your hand. And I mean, this is gracious of the Lord in spite of King Zedekiah's weak leadership, in spite of his failures, in spite of his fickleness, in spite of his treatment of God's prophet, God wanted King Zedekiah to understand one very important thing, and that was that he wanted him to know that his life would be spared if he would simply yield to the word of God. But something prevented King Zedekiah from moving forward. Something prevents him from moving forward. Let's look at verses 19 through 23 together. Then King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I dread the Jews who have gone over to the Chaldeans, for they may give me over into their hand, and they will abuse me. So it's fear. He's fearful of the exiles there. But Jeremiah said, they will not give you over. Please obey the Lord and what I am saying to you, that it may go well with you and you may live. But if you keep refusing to go out, this is the word which the Lord has shown me. Then behold, all the women who have, left, who have been left in the palace of the king of Judah are going to be brought out to the officers of the king of Babylon. And those women will say, your close friends have misled and overpowered you while your feet were sunk in the mire. They turn back. Then they will also bring out all your wives and your sons to the Chaldeans, and you yourself will not escape from their hand, but will be seized by the hand of the king of Babylon, and this city will be burned with fire. This message wasn't a different message. It was the same message that God had for King Zedekiah. All he had to do, all that King Zedekiah had to do was surrender to God. That was it. God's will for the king is exceptionally clear in this text. The problem is King Zedekiah is fearful. He's fearful to move forward in faith. He feared the exiles living in Babylon. He feared for his own position as king within Judah. He feared for his own safety, and he apparently feared the fact that he was meeting with Jeremiah in this text, which was why he took Jeremiah into the third entrance that is in the house of the Lord, And it was why he told Jeremiah what he needed to say to the officials when they began questioning him. Again, he takes the position of fear. Just imagine after hearing this message from God, there's a way out. There's a way of life, a blessing. And he's more concerned with what his officials are going to think after having met with Jeremiah. Look with me, verse 24. We'll just take it through the rest of the text here. It says, Then Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, Let no man know about these words, and you will not die. But if the officials hear that I have talked with you and come to you and say to you, tell us now what you said to the king and what the king said to you, do not hide it from us, and we will not put you to death. Then you are to say to them, I was presenting my petition before the king not to make me return to the house of Jonathan to die there. Then all the officials came to Jeremiah and questioned him, so he reported to them in accordance with, with all these words which the king had commanded, and they ceased speaking with him since the conversation had not been overheard. So Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse until the day that Jeremiah was captured. Jeremiah did what the king requested. He obeyed the king's wishes and thankfully was able to stay in the, car, in, in the um, court of the guardhouse in place of that dungeon that he had been in in that last lesson. But just imagine here, Jeremiah... Is at the end of all this, he's locked up. The people in Jerusalem didn't listen to him. The king, King Zedekiah, has plainly rejected God's message, and he's just wanting, he's just waiting for Jerusalem to fall. And so from a human standpoint, if you look at Jeremiah, from a human standpoint, you would look at him and you'd see his ministry and you'd say, this guy is a failure. But he's not a failure in the eyes of God. Because as we're going to see in this next lesson, God rewards his children for their faithfulness to him. And Jeremiah looked like the loser in chapter 38. I mean, he did in chapter 37. He again looks like the loser in chapter 38. And Zedekiah looks like he's the winner. But in the next chapter, the tables turn. And what amazes me about this entire thing was that God gave King Zedekiah multiple opportunities to submit to his word. But time and time again, Zedekiah resisted those messages. And from what we have learned in this text today, he resisted those messages because of fear. He was fearful. He feared the future. So as we close out our time together, 
we are reminded of this truth that God notices when his children are persecuted by the world for standing on his word. And so if you are uh, being persecuted and you've been faithful to the Lord and you've been faithful to the word, be encouraged, be encouraged. God is in the background of this chapter protecting his servants and pleading for the king's repentance, offering up another opportunity for the king that he might change his ways in order to submit to God's word. There are consequences when we fail to obey the word of God. Before we close today, I'd like to end out our time with a couple of lessons that we find here in this passage. There are a lot of themes and lessons when you go through a chapter like this. Um, and so I wanted to leave us with seven important lessons, I believe, that we, can learn, that we can take away from chapter 38. Number one, it is worth it to serve Jesus Christ even in persecution. Even though God's prophet had been mistreated and persecuted, God still had a great work to do through Jeremiah. The second important lesson was this, that standing on the word of God may get you in trouble with friends, with co-workers, co-workers and even family members. Um, there are certain circumstances where people need to hear that what they are doing is sinful and wrong, and it's never easy to give people the truth of God's word, but it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. And the third important lesson that we can take away from this chapter is when you are serving Jesus Christ, God can send important people into your life to be a blessing to you. And he does that. When you're going through a trial or a difficulty, God can send individuals in your life to be just that, as, just as God sent Ebed Melech to Jeremiah. He can send important people into your life to encourage you and to be a blessing to, to you while you're enduring a test, perhaps. The fourth important lesson, fear can prevent you from making the right decisions in life and get you focused on all the wrong things. That is an, uh, a tactic that our enemy will use against us. Satan will use fear against the people of God to prevent them from doing what they need to do. King Zedekiah is full of fear. And I believe that in the end, he submitted to his fear. He submitted to something here. At the end of chapter 38, he, he doesn't go to Babylon. Or even in chapter 39, he doesn't humble himself to the word of God and, and go to the king in, in Babylon. He doesn't do that. He submitted to fear over the word of God. The fifth important lesson is we will not have God's blessing in life if we fail to obey his word. Instead, we will be disciplined or chastised, and there is no middle ground. In our next lesson, we will find out just who has God's blessing and who didn't have God's blessing after the events that are found in this, um, in this next chapter. Sixth important lesson, hang on to this. God's grace is sufficient for you. Turn to his living word. The Lord knew what King Zedekiah's response would be to his word. He knew what Zedekiah would re that Zedekiah would refuse his will that had been plainly laid bare before the king, and God was not surprised when Zedekiah chose instead to make decisions based on the fear of man over the fear of God. Yet God still gave King Zedekiah a choice, and the choice is simple. Follow my clear will and be blessed. Or resist my will by being disobedient to my word and come under my chastisement. That is a principle that we see all throughout scripture. This truth is very simple. If you are running from God's clear will for your life that has been laid out for you plainly in his word, if you're choosing instead to forfeit the blessing and peace that belongs to you in Jesus Christ for the passing pleasures of sin, you will not win. You will be disciplined. Turn to the Lord today and to his word and experience again joy, the joy of what it means to be in fellowship with Jesus Christ. And that brings us to the seventh important lesson. God saves sinners from the pits of sin's penalty, sin's power, and soon will save from sin's presence. Every person is born a sinner in need of a Savior. And thankfully, God provided. He provided his son. 
And jo- Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. Pretty straightforward. We can't earn our way into heaven by our good works. It must be by faith alone in Christ alone. There are no second chances. However, God's gift of eternal life is available for you today. Make that decision to trust Christ as Savior and you will be saved. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this incredible uh, passage that we've had the opportunity to study today. Lord, I pray that um, if if it is that any one of us uh, here or listening online have been running from you, if that would be true of us, may today be the day that we get right with you and we get right with your word and we purpose in our hearts and in our minds and our, in our lives to put your word first when we make decisions. I pray that as we go through this week, you would help us to be faithful and that you would give us strength and opportunities uh, to glorify your name. We give you praise now in the name I pray. Amen. You may be-